Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Caroline Colas, and I am the Senior Director of Health and Wellness at the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan. I'm also the coordinator for the Edmund J. Safra Parkinson's Wellness Program, supported by New York's largest health care provider, Northwell Health. For over 13 years, the JCC has been hosting programs for individuals living with Parkinson's. And you can find these programs on our website at www.mmjccm.org forward slash Parkinson's. You can check below in the comments section of our Facebook Live for that information. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. This is a program for anyone whose life has been impacted by PD and those that love them. We want to uh, this conversation really to help put a face to Parkinson's and to introduce you to people thriving and living with PD, as well as experts who will share updates and research and practices that can help those that are living with Parkinson's. We welcome your input. If you wanna be on the show, or if you have a topic you think we should feature, please let us know. All your inquiries can be directed to Whitney Chapman, who teaches yoga for Parkinson's. We featured her on one of our previous shows. Her email is wchapman at mmjccm.org, and her information will be in the comments as well. So this show is live, and the excitement exciting thing about live uh, shows is that anything can happen. And unfortunately, our original guest, Dr. Ramdani, had a family emergency today. And so he is not going to be with us, but not to worry, we will bring him back and we will discuss deep brain stimulation with him and, and all the various technologies that he's working with, with people living with Parkinson's. It's gonna be an exciting show. I was able to secure a guest speaker at the last minute that I think you're gonna love and really enjoy hearing from. She's an Aussie and uh, she is not only does she have, um, well, she, gosh, she's like certified in everything, you know, from Pilates to um, Feldenkrais to Nordic walking, but we're gonna talk today specifically about this Nordic walking program that she has. We're gonna bring bringing it to the JCC program in the fall, either on Sundays or Fridays, and we're excited about this offering. It, it's, uh, you walk with poles and it really helps with gait, which is one of the challenges that people living with with Parkinson's experience. So I'm very excited to introduce you to Sonia Johansson. She and I have worked together for, I believe, I think it's probably about 15 years or so. She's an amazing expert and a teacher, as I said, of the Feldenkrais method and of Nordic walking. And I'll invite Sonia to come on. Hey, Sonia, thank you so much for, you know, jumping in and, and uh, saving us in this moment. Um, of course, it's a pleasure yes, uh, to be yes. part of the JCC family. Have, happy to um, pull up my sleeves and muck in at any time. <laughs> <laughs> well, what people don't realize is that you and I have actually taught in class together. Um, we've been colleagues and, and one of the most exciting things I love to do with our other uh, teachers is sometimes just get into the classroom together with our students and answer questions and kind of workshop things and you and I both have a fascination with the brain. How do you feel with your knowledge that when people exercise, when people move their bodies, that stimulates their brain? How, what have you noticed? Well, it, it's an interesting um, question because it's obviously very loaded. And although I don't have a science background, I try and read up on as much as I can as is related to my field. So I essentially work one-on-one -on -one with individuals. I do love teaching class and, and thank God for Zoom and all of that technology during COVID because it meant that I can continue to do that. But um, there's a sort of, there's two sides of the exercise story, which is that it's just, you've got to get your blood moving. Literally, you've just got to get your heart pumping. So that can be done in simple ways, getting on a treadmill, stationary bike, just depending on your balance or how you know uh, robust in terms of holding yourself up and being um, being able to locomote yourself but then there's this other side of the story where um, neuroplasticity isn't just your brain changing itself which it does do kind of organically but what we're beginning to understand is under certain circumstances and those certain circumstances for positive neuroplasticity that is actually also for negative is um, directed attention focus and that um, simply doing some of those 
sort of repetitive, fantastic for your heart, wonderful for your endurance, and not the kind of focused attention that are going to change the brain structures in the way that might be necessary, say, if you've had an injury or if that's a brain-based injury or you're simply aging like we all are. So these are yeah. not conflicting. Well, let, let's explain that and unpack that a little bit more. And let me ask you a question about that. There's also, um, in addition to that, there's also a kind of a debate between exercising rigorously and exercising um, with consciousness. Now, what I love about your work is it seems like you're able to do both with the Nordic walking. You kind of combine Feldenkrais with Nordic walking. And the reason why that is so important is because we want to, as you were saying with our neuroplasticity, we want to train our attention. We want to train our awareness. When we go, we had a an Alexander Technique uh, teacher, Bill Connington on, and John, who was uh, a study, who has Parkinson's and who also studies the Alexander Technique. And with his mind, because of his awareness, John's awareness was so great, he was able to actually calm the tremor down. So it sounds to me like what you're talking about when, you're, when you were mentioning neuroplasticity and directing our attention is that we want to be able to do both. Am I on to the right track? We want to be able to, to pay attention to our somatic messages, right? The messages that are coming from our soma or our body. And at the same time, we also want to get our heart rate up. Absolutely. And it's interesting because something like walking or running or even stationary bike, those sorts of activities for a common person, I'm just going to call, you know, someone maybe without a neurological um condition a common person is that they all happen behind our conscious mind we're not thinking left foot forward transfer weight now look across to the horizon so in a way um, we can be multitasking we can be thinking about our shopping list or you know if there's a car coming or um, how much our you know loved one is bugging us or <laughs> whatever it is but um that just means we'll just continue to reenact the same habit. Now, if that pattern, a habit, is simply a pattern that happens without conscious awareness, um, is fine and good or good enough, no problem. But for most of us, we, we tend to have a little list or a little asymmetry. So even for a fairly ordinary functioning person, it can be a really powerful tool to prevent wear and tear um, in, uh, and those sorts of chronic kind of conditions that we do to ourselves as well as simply um, managing your, yourself in gravity. So that's often called fall prevention, managing yourself in gravity. But also walking across the room is managing yourself in gravity because the last time I looked, I don't have any hooks in the center of my head, neither do I have any strings holding up my arms. So it is my relationship with the earth as it is yours and the chair that you're sitting on um, that allows you to sit tall. It's your continual pressure um, uh, dance with that surface or the surfaces that allows you to move. Um, maybe breathing is not exactly one of them, but we do find that like astronauts, people who are in space because they're lacking the effect of gravity, which actually helps um, inhalation. Um, you know, they're, they're working a little harder to do things like simple things like breathing. So uh, it, it, it is powerful tool if you choose to go there. It's also immensely taxing if you've, um, uh, there's that wonderful book by Daniel Kahneman, um, System One, System Two, you know, like um, the two ways of thinking, the sort of like unconscious is just how we get around. You know, if you had to think every time, how do I pick up a spoon and put it in my mouth? you'd be much thinner, <laughs> right? Um, but um, then when those uh, those movements are somehow compromised, either by a structural orthopedic issue um, or, you know, as we say, brain-based, you do actually need to start looking, as I say, at the detail, at the minutia, you know, that phrase. Um, it's probably not an um, American phrase. Look after the pennies and the pounds take care of themselves. No, uh, that is a no. new one. Well, it's actually, it's like, um, um, what's the one about not seeing the forest for the trees? Mm -hmm. Well, the trees are the forest and each individual tree is like each tiny action at any given location. And because muscles can only do one of two things, muscles 
when they when they engage, when they activate, can either mobilize, which is create movement at a joint or a given series, depending on where that muscle passes, or it can stabilize. And unfortunately, this is what I've observed, and I think our, our special guest is going to talk about this maybe, is that for people with Parkinson's is that their muscles are actually doing a lot of stabilizing and bracing that they don't actually want. Mm. Um, you know, this is apart from uh, dystonia. This is where if, as soon as you or I feel any disturbance in our um, balance, we, we might, because we have a sort of a different system going on, we'll wobble into it and we'll adjust accordingly. But someone who's at any kind of risk of falling, they're going to lock down. And it's that interference of that unconscious need to remain in control that's the hardest to uh, change it's it's really it takes a lot of trust and that's why although Nordic walking we do it out in the park I work one-on-one -on -one with people I work in their homes and they might do um, some of the movements some of the what I call transmissional forces through the skeleton it's just a fancy way of saying how do you as a human being stack yourself up well your skeleton is eight million years in of an evolutionary story and it's designed to do that and Moshe Feldenkrais said that um, in ideal standing your posture is such that you're using the least amount of energy to be here but um, when you don't have the liberty to be able to be a little bit soft agile and exploratory your first reaction is to lock and then you need a harder muscle engagement on top of that. It's like insult to injury. And this is why, you know, our friends and our students with PD are just exhausted because they're working double time. Mm -hmm. So adding something as important as some kind of cardiovascular exercise, they're potentially putting some of their more delicate joints at risk, which is why something like Nordic walking can be a really great tool for taking the load off knees or hips or lower back and to distribute the forces throughout their entire skeleton, arms included, which, by the way, is why it's also a great sport for people who are concerned about their bone density. Yeah. yeah. Well, and we can explain what Nordic walking is. So essentially, yeah. Nordic walking is like walking with two poles. You think of those as ski poles or our walking poles. And the other really great thing about the most, she has them with her, awesome. Yes, the great thing about it is that, again, sometimes Parkinson's affects one side. And so when you're walking and using the poles, you're actually being encouraged to use that cross lateral movement, aren't you? Yeah, it's really powerful. And certainly the, the poles can be used at every level of your capacity, meaning I have some folk who are really using their pole like a crutch. And it's a great option because it, it gets them um, out. It gets them feeling like, well, it's a bit more effort to walk, but certainly a walker is much more limiting. It's a little, it can be a bit more uh, dexterous with poles. And when you begin to feel you have the strength and the coordination for it, you start to use the poles not for leaning on or bracing or what you would do if you were hiking, you would actually begin to thrust off them, which is ideally what you're doing with your foot or your back foot when you have an optimized walk pattern, you're actually not um, putting one foot in front of the other. Your back leg is like the, the engine on an outboard motor on a small boat. It's actually giving you the forward momentum. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the hips on either side have to stabilize. So in essence, I've heard that um, or the glute need, you know, and all the, the muscles in the back on one side. And we, we think of stroke patients, right, who are affected by one side and how stabilization is affected as well. So the poles can really help that sense of safety. If I'm feeling safe and secure, then I'm not going to have to use as much effort. Right. And so the, the poles help us commit to it's like having four legs. Right. We've got a walking stick uh, in either either hand and also our legs as well. So that increased stability can enhance relaxation. And when we have relaxation, then we can work on efficiency right, of movement. Speaking of efficiency of movement, um, 
you also teach Feldenkrais and you teach Feldenkrais in, in combination with Nordic walking. How, how, what impact does that have those two together? And then I want to bring Susan on because she's actually one of your students. She is. She actually came to me um, through Nordic walking and then became a, a Feldenkrais student. So I wouldn't say I teach Feldenkrais and Nordic walking together. What I do is I teach Nordic walking with a Feldenkrais lens. I actually don't think anyone does it like this, although um, if anyone is familiar with the Feldenkrais method, they may have heard of an extraordinary teacher that one was one of his um, first students, um, a ment mentee of, of Moshe, and her name is Ruthie Alon. And Ruthie actually took Feldenkrais from this um, sort of, it was getting, as a, it's a, I call it the floor fish, where people go, oh, Feldenkrais, it's too soft, too gentle, too slow. And then I have to sort of remind people that, that Moshe Feldenkrais was actually a martial artist. And, and he was um, teaching in Israel um, in a place called, um, in a street called Alexander Yonai. And uh, he had people on the bare floor. It was a cement floor basement. And they were rolling around and he had them doing things that looked very much like Aikido. And at that time, because it was, you know, at a difficult time in Israel's history in the, um, let's see, in the 40s and 50s, is that people had to be able to defend themselves. So he was really interested in um, being able to go from these two important states in your nervous system, which is the... Um, sympathetic, parasympathetic, which are really terrible ways of describing uh, rest and digest and the leap into action and be the effective dynamic self you need to be. But to be able to go between them quite quickly at a moment's notice, because most of us are actually in sympathetic, which is this, I'm ready, you know, I'm doing my interview and my whole vision is locked down and I'm completely unaware of anything um, either side of me and my just my digestion is now limited so this idea of being relaxed in almost any given situation so yes I do teach Nordic walking but always from a sensory um, perspective and for some people it's it's a bit odd and there's quite literally um, a lot of this me and my voice and asking lots and lots of questions about what you're feeling so if if you're you know, the difference perhaps between a regular class and a somatics class is there are many, many more questions in a somatics class being posed than literally poses. There's no demonstration as such because I don't want you to do the movement like me, even if you could. But actually, you can't because you're not five foot two of my DNA genetic background with my series of injuries. So you just can't do it like me anyway. And why would you? Yeah, I was thinking about when you were talking about um, this uh, ability to go from parasympathetic to sympathetic or from fight and um, flight freeze to rest and digest as animals. And the best example I have of that is, you know, the cheetah, which can just be completely relaxed. And then if it needs to run, run, right? And so that ability is what it sounds like Feldenkrais was, was wanting to train people to do. And you're right, we, we don't tend to, we tend to be stressed or concerned. Uh, and if we're walking around and we don't feel safe or stable, we're going to be in that state, that sympathetic state or arousal state all the time. And that takes a lot of energy. So let's bring Susan on and have her talk about what it's like to take your classes and and be with you susan welcome to the call and you just have to press your let's see there, there she go. is hello all right nice to see Hi. you thank you so much for joining us um My and pleasure. you yeah so can you tell us a little bit about uh the how you started working with um with sonia, with sonia? Mm -hmm. Yes, and for me, uh, I mean, everybody's a little bit different with Parkinson's, but for me, what, what really uh, changed for me was my walking. That's when I knew something was wrong. I was walking like a Frankenstein and I didn't know why. And I knew it wasn't the knee surgery I had had and I was trying to figure it out. And my doctor finally figured out that it was Parkinson's. So mm -hmm. the problem is when you, you know, your whole life 
after a certain year, a number of years, like two, you start to walk and you don't really think about it anymore. It becomes just something that you do automatically. And then for me, what happened was I had to switch that over and think about walking all the time. <laughs> and it was making me crazy. It was just really nutty. And um, when, I, when I met Sonia, she talked about this Nordic walking class that she was going to be teaching. And I thought that sounded like something that would really be helpful to me because it's difficult to coordinate arms and legs sometimes. And I thought, well, this is a chance to work with both your arms and your legs. It's a full workout. And it was just really intriguing to me. And then when I met Sonia and started working with her, the Feldenkrais aspect of this is something totally different. It's not like we're running on a treadmill or, you know, doing a, doing something, walking, climbing up and down mountains. It's at feeling what you're doing, paying attention to what you're doing and trying to coordinate your walking in a way that makes it smooth and mm -hmm. strong at the same time. And as she tells me, I get, I get frustrated because I can't get enough speed going, <laughs> but she tells me speed is not really the issue here. And, and that's good to know because I think sometimes we think that faster is better, but it's not mm -hmm. always the case. And um, I've, I've been doing, uh, I think I've been doing Nordic walking for, I'm, I'm not sure again how many years, but like three or four years with Sonia in the park. And I've gotten better. And uh, again, now this is related to medication too. If I come into the class and I have, I'm at an on period, then it's like, wow, I can do all this stuff. And I feel like a normal human being. And sometimes when I'm in an off period or going into a, an off period, it's more difficult and I get frustrated and, you know, I can't do it as well as I want to, but um, it's, it's very, it's, it's, it gets me out of the house. It gets me out in the park. It gets me moving. And that really is the important thing in the, in the end is to keep moving. As she says, keep your blood moving. Um, so I value it very much and uh, try to do whenever I can. Um, it, I just had a revelation yesterday. And that is about uh, the brain, the neuroplasticity. With mm -hmm. Parkinson's, there's so many things that we do differently. We have to, you have to sometimes find a new way to do the old thing. You can't do it the old way. It doesn't work that well anymore. And I realized with the on periods of medication, you're going back to the old ways. You're going back to, and I even say to myself, I'm like, oh, now I'm like a normal person again. Mm -hmm. But then in the off periods, then you have that's when you have to struggle with finding the new way to do something that makes it easier during that period and so i'm thinking oh my gosh it's almost like an addiction you want to go back to the to the normal person so you know you you strive to do that rather than working on the new ways the new pathways in the brain that you want to explore new and better ways of doing it for your current condition or your current status it's it's very strange i i'm i'm I haven't fully thought it out yet but it just occurred to me that i'm like a drug addict <laughs> you know? well i love that you're making this realization now because then you know victor frankel talks about that in between stim stimulus and response there's a pause and in that pause we get to choose and what i hear you saying and it's something that we want to offer in our program all the time is this opportunity to choose and sometimes I hear from my students, like, do I have, can I choose how I move? But what you're saying, Susan, is actually you can. And that's really exciting. That's really exciting. And I wanted to say to you that um, in Nia, we talk about speed being the illusion of mastery, right? So impatience, I think, is something, especially if you're a New Yorker. You, uh, I think we all pretty much have a, a bit of that in our DNA, our, our city DNA from the city that we live in. So it's it's uh, training ourselves to be a little bit more patient. There's a there's you guys met because of a workshop and a book and an interview. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Sonia? And because it's an amazing story. Yeah. Um, so some of some of your listeners, your viewers probably heard about neuroplasticity from an author named Norman Deutsch. He wrote two New York Times bestsellers and the one, The Brain's Way of Healing, actually features 
two chapters on the Feldenkrais method um, and uh, one very much about his history and also another chapter of a gentleman named John Pepper who, um, as he puts it, walked off his Parkinson's. So he used his version of conscious walking to basically um, his, his Parkinson's symptoms for many years were under control with no medication, but a very rigorous walking program that he did for himself. So he, um, John Pepper was doing sort of national, uh, sorry, international tours. He's from South Africa and he reached out to um, some of us folk in the Feldenkrais community and we hosted some events where he talked about his personal practice and how he works with other people with Parkinson's. And we were just, we were trying to really see where the crossover of um, the awareness through movement, which is really the underpinnings of everything in the Feldenkrais method and what John was doing, who'd never heard of Feldenkrais. And um, to, we, uh, he also presented at the Feldenkrais conference that year. And we did a pilot project where we took uh, groups of people and we had the, the blind, you know, the double blind, this group did nothing and this group did John's protocol and this group did the Feldenkrais protocol. So we got some initial numbers. It, it hasn't come to a proper study yet. And, and then I ran a, I think it was a six week program. And like, uh, like Susan says, I don't know how you heard about it, but you did, thank God. <laughs> so um, I had a group of people and we met in a studio, uh, like a large uh, yoga studio actually. And we learned about how, um, the, the, the mechanisms of the spine, the mechanisms of um, your central axis, um, how they affect your walking. And we started to in, include the walking poles, very much like how Ruthie Alon started to do this in her work called Walk for Life. And then eventually we went to, I think it was Madison Square Park because we were down in my studio um, at that time. It's on 20, 28th Street. So that's how we met. It's awesome. And yeah. Yeah, can we sh can you demonstrate a little bit of maybe something? I know that Feldenkrais is usually not done by a demonstration, but maybe mm. um, you can talk us through something, and Susan and I can do it in our own way, just so that our listeners and viewers can kind of get an idea of what it, an experience might be like. Yes, I like to say watching uh, a traditional Feldenkrais. Um, class is like watching paint dry so if you're tuning in please don't watch the paint dry on other people's screens just let your own paint dry so what I suggest you just you do if you're close if you're sitting at a desk or at a table just move back so just um, clear a little space in front of you if you were going to lift up or kick your leg you wouldn't hit your chin or anything like that and um, go ahead and, and uh, stand up and um, it's an invitation. Nothing is an is a instruction. Nothing is a direction. And then um, sit down. Hmm. And I know that it's just the three of us on this particular call, but how did you do that? Because if you can answer the how, you're now a Feldenkrais teacher. Literally, if you can answer to the, well, and, and Susan knows it's not just put my hands. You know, look, I didn't say, make sure you don't use your hands, you know, keep your head up while you get up. Just ask you to stand up, which I'm almost certain, almost everyone listening could, could do to some degree. So what we're gonna do is sort of unpack that, understand what it does mean to do these seemingly simple everyday activities. So come to the front of your chair. If you're comfortable to sit without leaning on the backrest, go ahead and do that. And um, simply uh, sense how much effort is to sit without leaning. For some people, they never do this. Others are always sitting on stools. So they're always using their spinal muscles, using their trunk muscles to hold them up. But the question really is, how much effort? Now, if you say none, that's not true. Because if it's none, you're actually currently lying on the floor as you're listening to me. And the answer is to what extent, sorry, the, the, the real understanding is to what extent are you utilizing your bones to support you, which is one of the roles of bones and what extent are your muscles doing it? Now, I know some of you are gonna be horrified, but could you slump? Could you kind of collapse? And you probably, you were sitting like that while you were listening to us anyway. So when you <laughs> collapse, <laughs> how much height did you lose? And then if I said, bring the crown, the top of your head closer to the ceiling without standing up, obviously just stay seated. What did you do to make that event happen? 
So go back and forth between what you might think of as collapsing or slumping. Of course, if you've got herniated discs, don't do too much of this because you're gonna put an enormous load on those um, gelatinous uh, spaces between your vertebral bodies. But as you're doing this, are you aware of what your pelvis, your pelvis is what your hip joints are seated in and it's very, very much like a bowl. So if you put your hands on the sides of your pelvis, you'll actually be resting your hands on what is your pelvic basin. And if I simply said to you, rock your pelvic basin a little bit forward and backward, which direction is easiest for you? Does one feel like sinking with gravity and the other one feel like Sisyphus pushing that boulder up the hill, right? One direction is actually yielding to gravity and the other direction is working against. So if you're tired, and I know it might seem ridiculous, I'm tired, I've just been sitting down, but the act of thinking and directing your attention can be very draining on your you know, brain. So if you're still joining us at the front of the chair, great. Um, notice, did you, were you aware while you were rocking your pelvic base and my lovely jade bowls tipping forward and backward, were you aware of what your feet were doing or where they were? Because I'd like you to just tuck your feet under the chair. You might be in an office chair and maybe you can't really put your feet, but some people actually just sit like this. I call it perching, you know, like the ball of your foot's on the floor, but your ankles are crossed. Go back to that exploration of what I'm starting to call, just to make it simple, tallifying, crown of head closer to ceiling, shortifying. So not lowering your chin and looking down past your knees, but continue to look out ahead of you. Imagine you were at a, a big a, a big dining table, large 12 foot dining table, and you wanted to catch the eye of the person across from you. Yes. Now plant your feet. Hello, how are you? <laughs> That's how you do it. Plant your feet. So the soles of your feet from heel to toe and the whole undersurface of each foot has its own section of the floor. And just play with that same action. Many of you know this action as a spinal movement that we call flexion extension. And here's my little toy I like to use. Simple, um, very objective kinds of ideas because some of you are actually, I can't see you, thank goodness, are moving your spine like a stick. If you were doing this sort of um, articulated, soft, serpentine style of um, articulating your spine, can you try the stick version? So can you rock your pelvic basin? Yes. If I was having an interview with you right now, you would be doing <laughs> what Caroline's doing. She's like the <laughs> drinking bird, right? So there is a perfect example of your the muscles of your spine can either stabilize or mobilize. And we don't really, we're not consciously aware of that until we are drawn to be aware of it. Now, I don't mind which foot you use. Do we have a little more time? Because we're going to do. Mm, I think we're oh. good. I think we're, we're good. almost good. Okay. So let's wrap up. Yeah, let's yeah. wrap up. So these sorts of questions, these sorts of small, seemingly insignificant movements. Remember the phrase, can't see the forest for the trees. If you can't make out what those trees are, you don't know if it's a forest or actually, you know, a crowd of humans or umbrellas. It's, it's really understand the elements that go to make up larger actions. And for Feldenkrais, it's functional actions actions that have outcome, actions that have purpose. It reminds me of, you know, what we do in NIA, which is kind of isolate and then integrate. Yeah. It's like, can you move different things so you can see, again, going back to what you were talking about, mobility and stability. Now, Susan, I feel different. I feel a little taller. I feel like I have a little more space in my spine. How about you? Do you notice a difference even from that? Yes. And I feel like I, I'm when I'm sitting taller, everything feels so much better under my ribs where I, I tend to crunch and feel tight otherwise. But it's like I can lift my, it's like you can get a breath, you know, and yeah. taller and feel and I, wider. And I was, I was thinking so much, uh, so many people living with Parkinson's also have trouble with rotation, right? And this um, sort of locking in of the, the torso, the rigidity of the torso. Um, so this just simple exercise that we did was really wonderful. And whether I'm moving again, would you call it the bird? Oh, the drinking bird. There was a, a, a toy back in, I don't know. In the, in the I remember. <laughs> I forgot. 
the importance of making it functional is to say at the beginning, you'll do a movement, a very commonplace movement. So at the end, like bookends, come and stand up. Because now when I ask you to stand up, can you tell what it is you're doing with your pelvic basin? Does it rock forward or backward at even the moment before, like the, the Frankel, the Victor Frankel, that moment before action becomes evident? There's a whole lot of planning and that's where the sensory, the kinesthetic sense is profoundly important when it comes to movement. So that is the, the real key, isn't it? And I also, I don't know, Susan, if you feel this way, but in relationship to what we were talking about, which is fight or flight or the parasympathetic versus the sympathetic, I feel more relaxed, right? From just even that small bit of movement. And I'm more aware when I stood up, I was just more conscious of my whole body, whereas before I didn't even think about it at all. Right. So this we idea would say of global stories and local connections. So what's going on at that low level, but how does it go to a bigger picture? So actually, um, we don't talk about isolation in film mm -hmm. class because that already has some people in a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah. A lot of very clever, clever movers and dancers out there who are excellent at that. So yeah. this, this, this spreading of work, um, somatic Marxism is another interesting idea. Yeah, so um, thank you both for sharing your lunchtime with me and today because it's just been so fascinating and interesting. I, I have a feeling that we just like scratched the surface of oh, both yeah. of these modalities, both the Nordic walking and the Feldenkrais. And it's great to have a little bit of an introduction to these things. Now, of course, Sonia teaches Feldenkrais on Wednesdays and Sundays at the JCC in our regular programming. Her Nordic walking program is also available now. We're going to be doing one specifically for people living with Parkinson's in the fall, in September. Um, we wanted to, to have people, why was it? We kind of didn't want to, it's really hot right now. <laughs> yeah. That so we want to wait till it hurdle. cools <laughs> off a little bit. Yeah. So you don't have to, as Susan said, you don't have to get up really super early, like, you know, seven or eight o'clock in the morning. For yeah. some of us, that's a little tough. Um, Thermoregulating so, is also a big issue for people. Yeah. People. So we're going to wait and do that in the fall. But um, if folks uh, want to get a hold of you, um, can they... Uh, can they can we put your information in the chat so they can do that yes um i'll uh, post my website where you can actually get a free sample of the short feldenkrais lesson like a mat lesson and um if you want to contact me directly my email address is simply sonia at sonia .com. so just pop that there and Welcome yes, and we'll to put share that. It. I'll do that yeah, later. we'll put yeah, that in the super. comments. Absolutely. Um, Susan, any final comments that you would might want to make to those that are living with Parkinson's about how this has helped you? Or ah, oh, well, it's for me. Um, I come from a theater theatrical background, so I'm a performer. I'm an actor and a singer. So moving is everything, and. Um, I do find that when I'm performing, somehow the Parkinson's symptoms go away, which is very interesting uh, with, this, with the brain plasticity issue. But I got to say that um, I always feel better after Sonia's class. And it feels, I, I always feel like I can breathe better, I can move better. And I think um, working my spine like this has really saved me and, and uh, given me a, a kind of new lease, lease on life. I can go out and, and you know, make, it, make things happen. Even though sometimes I feel scared or sometimes I feel um, worried that I'm not gonna be able to accomplish something or, or make it happen. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, that's one of the pluses, I think. I've gotten confident. So now when I go on the subway, I just take my time and I can go through crowds of people and when I go through a turnstile or a door, I don't freeze up. I just think big step and I walk through there. And uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, been, it's been great. Uh, I really value the, the lesson time and, and, the, and the lessons learned from Sonia. Awesome. Well, th I thank you both. And I remember, just wanted to, to remind everybody that next Monday, July 19th, 
We will talk about genetics and more with Dr. Rebecca Gilbert. She's uh, the Chief Medical Officer of the American Parkinson's Foundation. Have you ever heard her speak, Susan or, or Sonia? No, I have not. No, oh, she's delightful. You can ask her any question you want. She just really is a, a breath of fresh air and has such beautiful knowledge. So I invite you both to, to tune in as well as everybody else. Um, if you have any questions for Sonia or anyone, please uh, put them in the chat or in the comment section and we will answer them. Um, and as Sonia, as you share this, if people have uh, questions, please do share this with people living with Parkinson's. Our goal is to just get information out there so people know that there are resources to help them with their walk, their gait, and also sensing their body. I thank you both. Have an, have an amazing pleasure. day, everybody. We'll see you next week. Thank you.